reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter and John were going up to the temple area for the three o'clock hour of prayer. And a man crippled from birth was carried and placed at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate every day to beg for alms from the people who entered the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked for alms. But Peter looked intently at him, as, John, as did John, and said, Look at us. He paid attention to them, expecting to receive something from them. Peter said, I have neither silver nor gold, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, rise and walk. And Peter took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles grew strong. He leaped up, stood and walked around, and went into the temple with them, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the one who used to sit begging at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with amazement and astonishment at what had happened to him. Verbum Domini. Glad and rejoice in it. 
Dominus Fobiscum, et un Spiritu Tuo, Lectio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Lucum, Gloria Sibitae. That very day, the first day of the week, two of Jesus' disciples were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus. And they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped, looking downcast. One of them, named Clopas, said to him in reply, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? And he replied to them, What sort of things? They said to him, The things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people, how our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since this took place. Some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he is alive. Then some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described, but him they did not see. And he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all that the prophet spoke! Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. As they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on farther. But they urged him, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. <clears throat> and it happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were open, and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven and those with them who were saying, The Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Verbum Domini, <laughs> My friends, as we continue to celebrate the joy of the risen Christ in the Easter season. The most important of all of our liturgical times as we rest within the octave of Easter, the eight solemn days beginning with Easter Sunday, with today being the midpoint of the octave, Wednesday in the octave of Easter. Now each day the octave is a celebration of Easter, as we know, a way of prolonging our joy of the risen Christ and of Easter Sunday, with the every day within the octave celebrated as a little Sunday. The octave will end this coming Sunday, the second Sunday of Easter, the celebration of the divine mercy. But our Easter celebration will continue for 50 days until the celebration of Pentecost. 
The Holy Scripture in this week surrounds us. It infuses us with joy and wonder and surprise, but sometimes even fear and confusion, as we know was experienced by Mary Magdalene and the other women and the disciples that sing and meeting the risen Christ. Today, we listen to St. Peter in the Acts of the Gospel. St. Peter, who was once sad and repentant and afraid, who denied Christ three times. He's now strong. He's unafraid. He cannot be kept from preaching about Christ and sharing the good news. In today's reading from the Acts, we witness, along with those gathered around the temple, the power of the risen Christ at work through Peter with the healing of a man who had been crippled from birth. Peter seems to know from the outset that he was going to do something wonderful and miraculous for this man. Somehow he knew he had the power to heal him and also that it was God's will for him to do so. So miraculous events are occurring. Souls are being stirred. But Christianity, as we know it, is still in its infancy. And in St. Luke's Gospel, we go back to the day of the day that Christ rose from the dead. We join two of Jesus' disciples, Clopas and another. They're on a journey on the very day Jesus rose from the dead. These two disciples had been badly shaken by the events of the last few days. And in many ways, they exemplify the disillusionment felt by Jesus' followers after what would seem to be as a total apparent failure by dying on the cross. The apostles and the disciples had courageously, courageously left homes to follow Jesus. They had listened to his words. They witnessed his miracles and even gone out and preached in his name, they had expected Jesus to be the longed-for Messiah. But when Jesus entered into his hour, into his passion, when so much hatred of the society then existing was exhibited, when Jesus was accomplishing the work for which he had been sent, it was at that moment the disciples abandoned Jesus. What went wrong? This wasn't expected. God worked in a way which they could not comprehend or yet accept. There was the cross, the suffering, the pain, the blood. Surely, surely this was not part of the plan. Oh, it was good when there was the glory of the miracles, the encouraging crowds, the euphoria, the high emotion, the beautiful words that Jesus preached and taught. But when the cross cast its shadow, they said or thought this was not what they signed up for. The supernatural rising of Jesus from the dead was outside their paradigm of belief. And so these two disciples, or on their way back home to Emmaus, back to their own lifestyles, back to what is familiar to them. Hopes are shattered. Their faces are downcast. Their conversation is somewhat a self-pitying, self-reconstruction of the events that occurred over the past few days. They are sunken in their own sorrow. Their journey is taking them away from Jerusalem the holy city where Christ celebrated the Last Supper and celebrated his, or suffered his passion. They are going away from the place of Easter glory and the resurrection of the Christ, the place where the church began. Their journey is taking them away from Jesus' reality, as St. Augustine once reflected. They were so disturbed when they saw him hanging on the cross, they forgot. They forgot his teaching. They did not look for his resurrection. They failed to keep his promises in mind. Jesus' death shattered their hopes and dreams. As St. Luke's Gospel conveys, 
they had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. But what they sought was an earthly redemption, a release from the principalities and the powers that ruled them. There was fear and disillusionment, disappointment. They saw the cross as an embarrassing defeat, and they could not yet understand, not yet comprehend, the promise of the empty tomb of the risen Christ. So these disciples, like perhaps many others, their hearts and minds are blinded to the reality of what occurred on that wonderful day when Christ rose from the dead. They are assessing what had happened. They knew something had happened, but they weren't certain quite what. It was beyond their level of faith to grasp what truly took place. So their hearts are downtrodden. They have this sense of loss. And in that state, they don't recognize Jesus when he joins them on their journey. Jesus comes to them with an understanding of their sorrow. He has a zeal for their souls. He comes to them even though they don't recognize him. Jesus journeys with them, and yes, yes, he does chide them for their slowness of heart to believe and to understand, but he also instructs them, and he guides them. He once again teaches them to the truth that he is as conveyed by Holy Scripture. And gradually, their eyes are opened, and Jesus' presence restores their spirits and gives them new and lasting hope. After they celebrate the evening meal with Jesus, the celebration of the Eucharistic meal, they recognize him just as they do so. Jesus seems to vanish. But does he really? Through the absorption of Holy Scripture, through the consumption of the meal with Jesus, he is now with them, he is now in them. So much so that they must return to Jerusalem immediately, return to Christ's church to tell the good news conveyed by Jesus. As Pope Benedict once conveyed, this marvelous gospel text contains the structure of Holy Mass. In the first part, listening to the word through the sacred scriptures. And in the second part, the Eucharistic liturgy and communion with Christ present in the sacrament of his body and, and his blood. And this is consistent with what our catechism teaches us. The Eucharistic celebration always includes the proclamation of the word of God, thanksgiving to God the Father for all his benefits, above all for the gift of his Son, the consecration of bread and wine, and participation in the liturgical banquet by receiving the Lord's body and blood. Now, it may seem <clears throat> incredulous to us that these two disciples who apparently were close to Jesus during his earthly ministry, would not recognize him. But let's also consider who were these disciples and why would they be honored within St. Luke's Gospel to be among the first to encounter the risen Christ. St. Luke names one of the disciples, Clopas, but the other is not named. There are many scholarly theories about who and what they were within biblical history. But let us consider this. These two disciples, who otherwise did not play a prominent part in the Gospels, they represent us, the majority of us, those of us who perhaps aren't world-renowned, world-acclaimed, but we are seeking and having our own journeys towards Christ. They, like us, are persons on life journeys. It's often a winding path, isn't it? Sometimes we are going towards Christ. Sometimes in our sinful natures we're going away from Christ. But let's not be too hard on them, for to do so be too, being too hard on us. Let's reflect a moment. Do we always recognize the Lord in his words? Do we feel him always through the Paschal mystery of the Eucharistic meal and in every action of our lives? 
What is remarkable about Holy Scripture is its applicability today as conveyed in the story of the road to Emmaus as it was in Jesus' time or at any time throughout the history of mankind. We, or those we know, may be like Clopas and his companion. At times, we may be so centered on our woes, our wounds, our sorrows that we do not recognize that Jesus is always there. He's always willing and always will walk with us. As Pope Francis once observed, the road to Emmaus becomes like a symbol of our journey of faith. The scriptures and the Eucharist are the indispensable elements for the meeting with the Lord, like the disciples who were despairing at the death of the Lord, we often arrive at Mass with our own preoccupations, our difficulties, our delusions. But the liturgy of the Word welcomes us, just as Jesus explained the scriptures to these two disciples, rekindling in their hearts, in our hearts, the warmth of faith and hope. Jesus, came to these disciples and opened their eyes. Their hearts were burning with the holy reality of Scripture. They were, as St. Faustina recorded in her diary, drawn into the bosom of the most holy trinity and immersed in the love of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, moments often that are hard to adequately describe. Jesus is tugging at our hearts, coming to us, to us at our level, to shepherd us, to enlighten us, to enlighten our conscience and to lead us to the truth. He never forces himself upon us. He wants us to beckon to him, please, Lord, stay with us, just as Clopas and his companion pleaded with the Lord to stay with them. Jesus is always there always ready to speak to us and provide us understanding of his ways. All we need to do is open the shutters of our hearts to permit his spirit to infuse us, to change us, transform us, especially within the Eucharistic celebration. At every Mass, when the bread and wine become his body and blood for us to be united with him, in the most special, the most holy, special, special way. And so like Clopas and his companion, as St. Pope John Paul II once wrote, upon recognizing the Lord, they set out immediately in order to report what they had seen and heard. Once we have truly met the risen one by partaking of his body and blood, we too cannot keep to ourselves the joy we have experienced. We can we should race out with haste and with joy to share our experience, to tell others about him, to share the good news, because so much joy cannot and should not be kept in one heart alone. Again, as St. Pope John Paul II once exclaimed, stay with us, Lord, faithful friend, and sure support for humanity. Stay with us, bread, of eternal life. Stay with us now and until the end of time.